Good evening, everyone. The uh, number of attendees looks to have um, leveled off, so I think we can make a start. Um, can I thank all of you for joining us this evening for um, this event, considering overlapping issues uh, as between the Court of Protection and the uh, first here tribunal uh, mental health. Um, there will be um, potentially um, time for considering questions um, and other issues, so drop anything into the chat if you'd uh, like our panellists to give you the benefit of their considerable expertise. Um, without further ado, let's uh, get things going. Uh, our first speaker this evening is uh, Helen Curtis, uh, who is also a member of uh, our sister chambers, Garden Court North. Uh, she is uh, extensively experienced in issues relating to mental health and capacity, both in the first tier tribunal and the Court of Protection. Uh, and takes cases uh, also in other jurisdictions, including the Parole Board and the Court of Appeal, where issues of liberty are at stake. Uh, she is also uh, a member of uh, the Court of Protection Mediation Panel, uh, and she will be uh, providing you a presentation uh, dealing with issues of capacity um, at various stages during the first tier tribunal mental health process, uh, and also addressing issues in relation to best endeavours uh, and the, the statutory duty to provide aftercare under section 117 of the Mental Health Act 1983. Uh, Helen, over to you. Thanks very much, Michael, and uh, a warm welcome to everyone this evening. Um, Michael's very kindly referred to my considerable expertise, but um, I've no doubt that I think we've got over 100 participants at the moment that there's going to be, uh, I can't say the room, the experience in the room, but certainly um, experience of attendees. And I hope that between myself and Tim, we will highlight some issues and hopefully invite some contribution um, from the considerable expertise of the attendees um, on these topics. So not just an opportunity to ask questions later on, but I hope um, an opportunity for people to share their experience and add to the pool of knowledge. Um, I'm going to just touch on, I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes or so, and I'm going to talk about capacity to make an application to the first tier tribunal, capacity during the hearing at the first tier tribunal, a Mental Health Act patient in the Court of Protection, and then I'll touch briefly on the best endeavours uh, for Section 117 discharge for aftercare before um, Tim uh, takes matters onto a deeper level. Um, so firstly, the capacity to make an application. Um, I just wanted to look at this case of SM versus Live Well Southwest um, CIC, a community interest uh, organization, uh, reported there. Um, this patient was aged 26 in 2019. She'd been diagnosed as paranoid, uh, with paranoid schizophrenia. She had had a short period of time uh, in detention about three years earlier. But at the time of her application in May 2019, she was initially detained under Section 2. She applied um, for discharge at a time when she was heavily pregnant, but over 35 weeks, I think, and wanted really to move to a mother and baby unit, but there weren't any spaces available. And she applied, and by the time the application was heard the section had been transferred to a section three. Um, so, but her application um, was struck out uh, for want of jurisdiction on the basis that she lacked capacity to make the application in the first place. Um, and although happily she gave birth uh, to a baby girl safe and well, um, and ultimately was discharged from section by her responsible clinician uh, about a month or so later, towards the end of July. Um, but it was considered by the upper tribunal that this was a sufficiently important point to, uh, to discuss, really, and to obviously make a ruling. So that, that short chronology, um, 
it was May 2019, there was a pre-hearing examination. Can we believe that those actually took place in person, given the world we're living in now? But that took place the day before the hearing. The hearing was on the 24th of May. Um, and to make the application, um, the patient had had the benefit of the help uh, of an IMHA who had assisted her in making the application. Um, but at the pre-hearing examination, the medical member considered that the patient lacked capacity. And there was no information that she had regained capacity um, as at the date of the hearing the following day. Um, but the, uh, the court were concerned about um, whether or not the first tier tribunal were right when they dismissed, uh, when they struck out, I'm sorry, when they struck out her application for want of jurisdiction. And so they considered um, under Rule 8 um, whether or not uh, she did have capacity um, to make this application. Um, rule eight, 8 allowing giving the tribunal power to strike out if they didn't have jurisdiction in whole or in part uh, strike out the proceedings in whole or in part um, and this decision is interesting because um, the salary tribunal judge um, Sarah Johnson who had gave a dissenting judgment and really looked at um, what the relevant information was that she, uh, the patient, needed to know to make this application and emphasised the fact that the patient wanted to leave the hospital and that ought to have been sufficient um, whether or not she ticked the form to say that she understood her rights and things like that. She wanted to leave and the tribunal was the only means by which her detention could be reviewed and she could successfully leave. So um, the, this decision focused on uh, upper tribunal Judge Jacobs' previous decision of VS versus St Andrews in 2018, and that test has got two parts. The patient must understand they're being detained against their wishes and that the first tier tribunal is a body that will be able to decide whether they should be released. Um, that, that test of capacity is to, to initiate the tribunal um, is supposedly set a, a sufficiently low threshold to ensure that Article 5 uh, safeguards are met and it's easy to make an application. It's similar to the case in the Court of Protection where the uh, Mr Justice Baker, as he then was, looked at the duties and powers uh, in the case of RD of RPRs uh, and IMCAs in that case and when it was that they ought to initiate a challenge under Section 21A to a deprivation of liberty. So there may be more on that. Uh, we've uh, seen the white paper for the um, reform of the Mental Health Act. So there may be more merging of those sorts of duties. But in this case of Live Well, effectively, um, they said, well, it's forensically difficult to reconstruct a patient's capacity um, and it's unfair on everybody that on the day of the hearing, uh, a patient's capacity is in issue uh, and construct, reconstructing the capacity of when they made the application is going to be very difficult. So there are some suggestions um, about making a reference that the responsible authority, um, potentially the hospital managers, potentially the IMHA, um, makes a reference to the Secretary of State so that that person who it appeared lacked capacity in advance of that hearing um, would still be afforded the right of review when it came to the hearing. So they decided uh, in the Administrative Appeals Chamber that there hadn't been an error of law in striking out. But as I say, it's an interesting dissenting judgment um, from uh, Judge Sarah Johnson. Um, so looking at capacity during the hearing, obviously there is the Rule 11 appointment mechanism uh, so that uh, 
the patient can be assured of representation during the hearing. There's no um, suggestion here in the first tier tribunal that there is a litigation friend. Um, that's, that's not the way it would operate. Um, so the appointment of a representative um, for the solicitors who are at the webinar, I'm sure you'll already be familiar with the Law Society practice note. It is in uh, Jones' manual at um, Appendix D and it's got all the detail there of what you as a solicitor need to consider when you're representing a patient either who lacks capacity um, or may lack capacity and what to do uh, in circumstances where you find yourself potentially going along to a hearing assuming because there is a presumption in favour of capacity, assuming that the patient does have capacity and then finding when you get there that they have not, or that during the course of the hearing um, they appear uh, to have changed in their mental state and potentially their capacity to continue to participate in the hearing is jeopardised. Um, the, uh, just recalling briefly a case uh, that I was involved in where they on appeal that um, the patient in that case during the course of their evidence started to, there was some manifestation of auditory stimuli and so the solicitor at the time asked that there be a, a pause so that the patient's capacity could be assessed because it appeared that there was a change in the mental state and the first tier tribunal refused to do that and continued um, and that was appealed and the decision uh, effectively was um, initially set aside because on the face of it um, this patient uh, the, the insufficient effectively when it did go to appeal, the decision was that there were there was inadequate reasons as to why the tribunal did not pause and review this patient's capacity. Um, fluctuating capacity obviously then presents a, a further hurdle, um, but it's very important that under Rule 11, the proceedings are going to be in the best interests of the patient if they do lack mental capacity, and that is, uh, as I say, totally separate from a litigation friend situation in the Court of Protection where different duties arise. Um, this quote at the bottom here, um, I've said it's paragraph 105, it is from the case of YA, I'll come to that in a moment, but uh, Mr Justice Charles said at paragraph 105 in the case of YA, this capacity issue should be considered and kept under review by all involved, so the responsible clinician, hospital managers, a tribunal appointed representative, any representative who has been or has purportedly been appointed by the patient and the tribunal itself. So it's a clear duty, I would say, that capacity must be kept under review. And if a first tier tribunal decides um, not to reconsider the matter when it's brought to their attention, they would have to have very good reasons uh, for not doing so. Um, it's just as Charles sets out in the YA case, um, the considerations uh, and says that effectively to determine that someone has capacity, that means, and this is the, uh, the actual hearing rather than the initiation of the application, um, which is a, a lower test. Uh, this is a, a more demanding test, if you like. Um, and to, for the assessment to be positive, that they do have capacity, um, then it's equates to appreciating the patient's ability to conduct the proceedings unaided. Uh, Mr Justice Charles sets out the purpose and importance um, of the actual review by the tribunal and so why it's so important to fairly and thoroughly assess the reasons for the detention. These are the things that the patient would need to have a grasp of to satisfy in effect um, any query over whether they had uh, capacity during the first tier tribunal. Um, so 
that's it uh, within the YA case. Um, just conscious of timing and uh, I'll move on to this case uh, which is important for the real overlap between a mental health patient and the court of protection. Um, there is a, as it were, a background to this, and I know that Tim's going to go into some of that with the Supreme Court's decision of MM and other uh, cases which impact on deprivation of liberty. Um, so just uh, in brief, um, this was uh, a person who, a patient, um, who was a restricted patient. Um, she was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia uh, and MC still required um, medical treatment but didn't require detention in hospital to receive that medical treatment and so since June 2019 um, she'd been living in a nursing home on extended leave under section 17 through the Mental Health Act. She applied in August to the first tier tribunal for a conditional discharge unanimously supported by her clinical team um, and then the first tier tribunal adjourned the case in the october of the same year so that a standard authorization under the mental capacity act could be obtained when the hearing when the tribunal sorry resumed in november um, the relevant standard authorization assessments had been uh, completed and so MC's solicitor simply asked the tribunal to um, defer the conditional discharge so that the standard authorization in effect could be come into being every all the paperwork had been done uh, proposed conditions were to continue to reside at the nursing home comply with the medication make herself available for any assessments medical assessments and thirdly to attend any suitable uh, appointments and the tribunal effectively said that they felt uh, they were sorry they regretted it but they were legally constrained they felt um, and they did not conditionally discharge um, MC they felt they couldn't do that they knew the conditions would amount to deprivation of liberty um, and so they refused to do so and in effect, um, uh, up a tribunal, Judge Jacobs said that that was an error of law, set it aside, and in July last year, remade the decision. And so MC was ultimately uh, conditionally discharged um, with those same three conditions. Um, and in effect, uh, the what, and I apologise if, uh, no pun intended, but if this does in fact overlap with what Tim's going to say shortly, but um, uh, Tribunal Judge Jacobs in effect quoted paragraph 27 of the Supreme Court's decision of MM, and it's whether the Court of Protection could authorise a future deprivation once the first tier tribunal has granted a conditional discharge and whether the first tier tribunal could defer its decision for this purpose are not issues, that's not issues, which it will be appropriate for this court to decide on at this stage in these proceedings. So Judge Jacobs looked at the case of MM and in that paragraph 27, which I've just quoted, says, well, there's the Supreme Court not making a decision. And then he went on to say that there was nothing in the MM decision, or in fact, the other case, which is referred to as KC, which prevented um, this happening. And what he was keen to do was achieve a coherence. Um, and he said that the tribunal was under a duty to find a way that allowed both acts to be applied in a coordinated manner. And that's what he achieved. Um, and you'll see a reference in the actual decision to uh, hats and ducks in a row and things of that sort. But if in effect, it's about um, ensuring that the patient or P um, is not in effect, doesn't fall victim to uh, administrative stroke, legalistic difficulties. Um, the uh, mental health case work section 
uh, did have some guidance in January 2019, which specifically looks at this. Um, this was before the Signet decision, the MC Signet decision, uh, and said that while the Mental Capacity Act does allow for a deprivation of liberty where the best interest requirement is met on the basis of preventing the patient from reoffending, generally the Secretary of State considers that such patients are best managed under the provisions of the Mental Health Act. And we have um, the case then of um, Birmingham City Council versus SR. That was a decision of Mrs. Justice Leaven where um, both uh, the applicants in, or the appellants, I'm sorry, in that case, lacked capacity to make their decisions about their care package, their liberty, uh, and where to live. And both uh, were restricted patients, um, and Mrs Justice Leaven drew distinctions between where the um, the balance lay, as it were, for um, the the risk, how the risk was going to be to be looked at, whether it was protecting P from uh, themselves or protecting the public from P, um, and those two appellants had different considerations. But um, the uh, the. The, Mrs Justice Leaven in Birmingham City Council reminded herself that there wasn't anything which stopped the Court of Protection being able to make orders in advance of a discharge uh, under the Mental Health Act. And in fact, uh, recently a case that I was involved in where there was a restricted patient uh, that patient was in a hospital which wasn't going to be able to remain open and alternative uh, placement was found. But in that case, the placement which would accept the patient uh, would not do so, whether it was for insurance purposes or not, I don't know, but would not do so unless that patient was there uh, with a standard authorization with a deprivation of liberty um, and so in that case the first year tribunal adjourned off the case went to the court of protection um, and in that case mrs justice thies made the relevant order uh, and then it went back to the um, first year tribunal so that the patient could be conditionally discharged um, in accordance with the um, standard authorization. Um, this is the uh, the last case, very old case now, um, 2003, um, but I'm just looking at the time so I am going to stop uh, in a moment and then potentially come back to some of these issues during the time for questions. Um, but just on this case, um, I know that Tim's going to speak more about section 117. Um, but this case, it's just worth, I thought, reminding um, myself, as I've had to recently, that there is no power, according to Lord Bingham, in this case of H, and that is one that the courts continue to rely on, no power to require any psychiatrist to act in a way which conflicts with their conscientious professional judgment. And that, in the case that I was involved in, there were, the patient, in fact, had been granted leave by the MOJ, stayed in their own uh, home alone uh, for three nights per week um, and could not, nobody could find a community psychiatrist to be the clinical supervisor for a conditional discharge. And that was a very protracted set of proceedings with the trust uh, having to send their director, being witness summonsed, etc., etc., all of that sort of thing. But unfortunately, um, the best endeavours test was one that um, came under some scrutiny in the eventual judicial review proceedings, um, where I was seeking to argue that they couldn't possibly have exercised or used all their best endeavours. How could it be? that uh, a clinical supervisor couldn't be found. And in fact, was one was ultimately found um, 
and uh, paid for eventually um, with the involvement of, as it was then, NHS England. So um, that's all I'm going to say because my clock says it's um, 5.30 and I'm under a duty to stop speaking. So I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you very much. Uh, Helen, thank you so much. Uh, lots of really interesting uh, points that you've covered there. And I can see that there are one or two questions already in the chat. Um, if you do have any questions, please do put them in the chat. We do um, really hope to have um, an interactive part to this session um, not too long after Tim's presentation. Um, another one of my colleagues who requires um, very little introduction, Tim Baldwin, is another one of our extremely experienced members of Chambers across a wide, wide range of areas, but for this evening's purposes, uh, in the context of mental health and court of protection. Uh, and he will be speaking on um, issues relating to the discharge of patients in circumstances that may otherwise amount to deprivations of liberty uh, and how those challenges might be negotiated both for the benefit of um, civilly detained patients, but also forensic patients um, before hopefully turning to considering challenges and issues in relation to funding. Tim, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. I hope everyone can hear me quite reasonably well. Um, you should see uh, uh, a standard slide, but what um, I'm proposing to focus on is in, in respect of uh, issues around the lawfulness of discharge from detention under the Mal Mental Health Act to effectively circumstances of detention under the Mental Capacity Act and uh, when there are requirements of uh, uh, an order that deprives somebody of their liberty as a result. It, it's, been, it's been clear for a num number of years that you cannot, for example, have a conditional discharge from detention under the Mental Health Act, which itself imposes conditions of um, deprivation of liberty on uh, the location um, by which the patient is moved to. Uh, but it, it's been very, a little bit protracted to actually get to the bottom of how to, how these overlapping jurisdictions operate and how they're supposed to operate smoothly. Because uh, you, you, you have different routes of discharge. Uh, not only do you have discharge through the tribunal itself, but you also have discharge via uh, the responsible clinician and the managers of a hospital independently of a tribunal. Um, this is slightly different when you have a, uh, a, a, a restricted patient, but the majority of patients uh, in, detained under the Mental Health Act are either detained under uh, uh, Section 3 or Section 37 without a restriction. And what it does is create issues in respect of uh, Section 17 leave and the operation of community treatment orders, in addition to uh, uh, issues around uh, conditional discharges for forensic patients. Particularly, we're seeing a growing class of patients who are detained under the Mental Health Act. And those are patients who are suffering from uh, uh, the extreme impact of dementia or severe brain injury. Uh, Helen has spoken about conditional discharge, but what you have uh, in effect is a growing class of patients where uh, they, by reason of uh, uh, their problems with the, the structural impact or structural injury to their brain, that they, they end up being detained under the Mental Health Act in order to manage initially uh, their their behaviour and their uh, treatment. So one of the uh, particular issues then is when they're treated, what happens to them uh, and what approaches and what procedures should the court of protection use? And particularly uh, if you'd have uh, disputes as to capacity and disputes as to what their best interests are in terms of their long-term care and the limits and problems associated with Section 17 uh, leave. Helen referred to uh, the House of Lords case in respect of uh, re-age and uh, 
what you might call the power of the psychiatrist, the power of the doctor and, and a clinical judgment. And uh, the uh, responsible clinician has a great deal of power in determining uh, when and where somebody uh, gets leave from hospital in anticipation of their discharge. And often what you will end up with is um, how do you resolve resolution of other conflicts, that is uh, funding of section, uh, funding and Im implementation of care, care packages under section 117. Uh, you have continuing healthcare needs. And we have to always remember that in addition to uh, the provision of care under section 117, which is related specifically to uh, someone's mental disorder, a lot of patients who are detained in psychiatric detention will also have social care needs that have to be met under uh, the CARE Act. So that there, there are a lot of issues potentially uh, for the Court of Protection to actually focus on when looking at a patient who lacks capacity to make decisions as to where to live and uh, receive care upon discharge from a psychiatric hospital. And uh, the Supreme Court kind of looked at some of these issues. And since the Supreme Court in um, uh, uh, MM and the Welsh Ministers and PJ, uh, issues have remained about the position of individuals lacking capacity to make decisions about residence and cares and care arrangements, um, given that the individuals in both cases had capacity. Uh, and it's and it's been there an issue can they leave hospital into circumstances of deprivation of liberty either on a community treatment order or by way of conditional discharge where is where there is a deprivation of liberty uh, authorized by the court of protection or under uh, uh, some standard authorization or does the supreme court's approach in these two cases any confinement to which a, a person is subject is unlawful um, in the Welsh Minister's case, uh, the Supreme Court held there's no implied power, for example, in community treatment orders, which have the effect of depriving a patient of his liberty. And this is, in my view, important because it relates, in a sense, to confirmation uh, that you cannot deprive somebody of their liberty uh, when they're under a conditional discharge, other than by way of... Uh, uh, a mechanism using the court of protection and it has an Im implication for section 17 leave because a community treatment order is uh, an amendment to the section 17 leave provisions of the mental health act and baroness now turned to what was a real issue in this case and it's whether the power to impose conditions amounting to a deprivation of liberty could be read into the me mental health act by necessary implication. Can you somehow do that? And she considered that the approach of the Court of Appeal had been put to, has been to put the cart before the horse, so to speak, taking the assumed purpose of a community treatment order, which is the gradual reintegration of the patient into the community and work back from that to imply uh, powers into the mental health act, which are simply not there. Similarly, that must be the case for uh, 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 a circumstance of a conditional discharge. There are no powers by implication that uh, can deprive somebody of their liberty. Similarly, when we look at section 17 in a little bit more detail, there cannot be any such powers there. So you have really very distinct statutory schemes that authorise the deprivation of liberty in particular circumstances. And the mechanisms of discharge effectively once you are discharged from detention under hospital say for powers of recall there is no no power to deprive you of your liberty and baroness Hale looked specifically in uh, by applying mm and pj to what is called the responsible clinicians powers and uh, it clearly does say that the mental health act does not give the responsible commission responsible clinician power to impose conditions which they have concrete effect of depriving a community patient of their liberty within the meaning of Article 5. So that does, in effect, limit to some extent a wide uh, clinical 
judgment of a uh, responsible clinician. They cannot say, well, I, I, uh, I, I can discharge somebody, but I think they really need to be deprived of their liberty and I'm going to make a condition uh, to deprive them of that uh, using my clinical judgment. They cannot do that for the simple reason that when they're exercising responsible clinicians' powers under Section 12 of the Mental Health Act, they are actually themselves a public body. So their, clinic, their clinical judgment and their clinical powers, as it were, are effectively limited by, uh, uh, by, by uh, statute in this way. And uh, what so Baroness Hale clearly identified the limits on uh, what, what, what are the responsible clinicians' powers. Similarly, in the judgment, she looked at um, the powers of the Mental Health Tribunal. That's the other standard route of discharge. And uh, the Mental Health Review Tribunal, as she put it there, has no jurisdictions over conditions of treatment and detention in hospital, but these can be relevant as to the statutory criteria of detention are made out, especially in borderline cases. But it, it, she does identify that uh, in this, that the uh, tribunal uh, ha really has no power beyond uh, that provided for it by statute, because it says, uh, similarly, the tribunal has no power to vary the care plan or the conditions imposed in a community treatment order, but the tribunal requires an up-to-date clinical report and social care circumstances report, including any details of a 117 aftercare plan. So the plan is relevant to discharge, and they're not, it's pretty clear they're not going to uh, discharge somebody who doesn't have somewhere to go, and the, the, the risk of discharge uh, would impact on them negatively in terms of their uh, application to the criteria that they have to do. Uh, but the tribunal itself cannot uh, create a situation where uh, it would allow an authorization of a deprivation of liberty upon discharge. Th that is my basic uh, uh, reading of uh, what we have here. So what are the relevant powers of the responsible clinician? The responsible clinician in terms of discharge planning, uh, together with the Ministry of Justice, when you have a restricted patient, has quite incredible powers, if you think of it, in terms of uh, authorising Section 17 leave, because Section 17 leave is often the key, key pathway to any uh, patient detained under the Mental Health Act to being discharged to a specialist care placement or, or, or home in, in, uh, after being detained in hospital. And often within that uh, decision-making, the responsible clinician will often identify and authorise a specific placement or type of accommodation. So it could be specialist care placement or discharge home with a proposal for support at home. And in reality that now Section 17 leave is only supposed to be used for short-term uh, uh, testing in the community. And, the, and it's open for a responsible clinician to consider community treatment orders on a long-term basis under Section 17A of the Mental Health Act when you don't have a restricted patient. And apart from the express power in Section 17.3, which I've identified uh, there for you, uh, there's no power to detain or deprive a patient of liberty, say for uh, conveyance in certain circumstances, under Section 17. So both leave uh, under Section 17, which is a vital element of discharge planning, and um, uh, leave under a community treatment order to a, a placement themselves cannot deprive somebody of their liberty. So if there is going to be a, a recommendation or part of the care planning which is going to end up depriving somebody of their liberty, either in a care placement or in the, the community, that there does really have to be uh, consideration of an application to the Court of Protection if the tribunal or the responsible clinician uh, 
it, it, they're at a stage where they're minded in some way to discharge the patient where they are uh, at the stage where it's not really uh, required that they remain in hospital. And just looking at the uh, uh, issues around the discretionary conditions of uh, uh, a community treatment order, uh, in, in the PJ case, all it required was compliance with his care plan in which the deprivation of liberty was located. Uh, and that, so, so it, that basically is what you require. You require a care plan, a care planning mechanism, whereby within that, uh, uh, if a deprivation of liberty is required, that should be clearly identified both in the section 117 uh, aftercare planning and also in any other forms of assessment of the, uh, of the patient. And there, there is a, a recent uh, report of a, a case uh, from last year, which is in the link there, where Mr Justice Hayden took the view in relation to community treatment orders, there was no uh, jurisdictional bar to the Court of Protection authorising a deprivation of, of a person on a CTO lacking uh, material uh, decision-making capacity, so long as the conditions on the face of the CTO did not give rise to confinement. And similarly, uh, that was by the application of MM and PJ. And similarly, that must be uh, when leave is granted, um, either uh, in anticipation of a conditional discharge or in anticipation of uh, a discharge from section under section three or whatever. So how do we go about this? Um, so there's no power to deprive a patient of the liberty when granted leave of absence. So the implementation of the care plan um, uh, has the effect of effectively depriving uh, uh, the person of their, their liberty. So that can be authorised under Schedule A1 of the Mental Capacity Act or under Section 16.2a of the Act. So there are two routes by which you can do it. And it's important to be aware of that as to uh, what you might call the vacation, the, 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 uh, the, the end point, the location or type of accommodation that is being proposed for the individual person because under uh, Schedule A1, if one looks at the definitions in sections 175 and 178 and 179, of the Mental Capacity Act, it, uh, it's either um, you can only get the administrative deprivation of liberty in a NHS hospital or independent hospital if it's moving somebody to a hospital or to a care home and, 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 uh, and under the Section 3 of the Care Standards Act. And that, that is uh, and you, the managing authority uh, is specifically identified in respect of section in, in under section 179 of uh, the Mental Capacity Act, both in England and in Wales. So one might have a series, a set of venues which the responsible clinician identifies as the appropriate place that they're willing to grant leave to, or the MOJ and the responsible clinician uh, working together are willing to grant leave to, which are not, not places which are covered by Schedule A1. Uh, so, uh, particularly if the, the proposal is to uh, have somebody go home with a care package that deprives them of their liberty, and that can only be dealt with under Section 16.2a of the Act. Uh, and the general recommendation is, if it's possible for the procedure under Schedule 1a, an application should be used, and that's referring to the case of a local authority versus PB. And if you look at that, that's in set paragraph 64.3. An authorization can only be granted, though, if there's no conflict between it and a condition of the patient's leave. So you can't really have a conflict. You can't really have an overlap. Uh, they, they they have to be very distinct um, uh, provisions. And uh, the cases, uh, Hospital Trust and CD and Ferreira, identify the key issues in the deprivation of liberty. And as I said, Section 21A does not apply to all care placements 
For example, it doesn't apply to hostels. It doesn't apply to uh, if you're if you're the proposed is to to uh, discharge you to a domestic setting. And this is it's really a key point to engage with with the court of protection as to what route by which uh, the person, if they are going to be deprived of their liberty under a, a court of protection order, what the precise nature of the application is going to look like and how the court of protection is going to deal with it uh, in respect of the best interest decision that the court of protection is asked to make and any order depriving uh, a person who's discharged from hospital uh, 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 and made subject to a deprivation of their liberty. So one has to be very careful in that process. It's not a rubber stamping process and it can lead to uh, problems when you get into the court of protection if the application is not properly brought. So what are the limits really of the court of protection? And really the court of protection is concerned with determining best interests of persons who can't make decisions for themselves. And the key decisions really is when somebody lacks capacity to litigate and lacks capacity to make decisions about where to live and care to receive. And, and in certain cases, in terms of contact with other persons, a public body, that being sort of a local authority or a, uh, a clinical commissioning uh, group, as, as they were called, it, they have a responsibility for the well-being of, uh, uh, of that person. And that's really uh, looked at in the context of uh, the CARE Act and whether best interest decisions, uh, which is a, fo a failure to promote a person's best being, may be a breach of a statutory duty under Section, section 1 of the CARE Act, uh, because the underlying uh, uh, duty there is a well-being duty. In the Court of Protection, a public body should be seeking to make an application to the court, especially if there might be safeguarding issues or, or to be a party to an, uh, an application uh, within a DOLS framework. So uh, who makes the application to the Court of Protection is the key thing. And my, my view is that if a, a local authority or a clinical commissioning group is supporting a package of discharge to a placement, they should be making the application and not the uh, patient. But often what you find is that the patient is making the application, they're left to make the application, and often they may be left to make the application under uh, Section 16 of the Act because no one's got their act together to make a proper uh, consideration of looking at whether uh, a, an urgent authorization of a deprivation of liberty to facilitate leave uh, should be made. Uh, and what basically what the Court of Protection has, has a power to do is to look at options for uh, different care packages that are placed before it and looking at the, the, the discharge of public body statutory duties in meeting those options. But the big question always arises is to, well, to what extent uh, can the Court of Protection compel a public body to discharge its function, duties and functions in certain ways or make specific funding decisions or deliver particular care packages in a particular time frame or to ensure there are sufficient resources available to make uh, 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 to meet the needs of the person, uh, particularly when you have disabled persons with and, and there's a, a complex array of policies and a need to authorise the deprivation of liberty and packages of care, identify packages of care that meet uh, both the person's well-being and their best interests. So you could end up not only uh, looking at something in the court of protection, but also looking at something in the administrative court if things get a little bit sticky on discharge. So what are the other potential problems uh, although Section 21A proceedings are not means-tested means for legal aid purposes, Section 16 proceedings are means-tested. Does this raise an access to justice issue and a civil liberties issue when you have a 
patient in a psychiatric hospital who's looking to be discharged. And the only route that that can be done is by a way of a Section 16 application. Uh, often people in psychiatric hospitals have quite, quite a substantial funds that they accumulate um, as a result of uh, benefits. So they, they often fall outside the uh, financial eligibility for civil legal aid, even though they fall within the non-means tested uh, legal aid uh, provision for representation before the tribunal. Also, uh, so if they do have sufficient means to pay in respect of a Section 16 application, uh, do they have a financial deputy, for example, to, to pay and authorise that litigation? So it can be a potential civil liberties issue in respect of the route by which uh, the uh, application and proceedings are brought within the Court of Protection as to the ability of the patient to participate within those proceedings. What if the best interest options, what if they conflict with uh, the uh, leave or the, the, the considerations of leave that responsible clinician is, is willing to consider? For example, if uh, one, uh, one uh, option is a care placement and the other option is a return home, uh, both with equal merit, but the responsible clinician says, I'm only authorising uh, leave to the care placement, uh, that's where I think the best interests of this person lie. How is this resolved? Uh, Section 717 aftercare, you have no contribution, but you do have an option of top-ups. So can somebody with sufficient means um, uh, bargain their way into a better position in respect of the deprivation of liberty, do they get a better uh, uh, outcome? For example, if you again had that uh, situation of uh, care, care placement versus return home, and the funding body said, well, it's much more expensive to pay for somebody to go home, but if they, if they wish to top it up, uh, we'll fund that, and they can pay the top up, so they can uh, go home and we consider that equally in the patient's best interest so therefore you have a situation where the means of the patient uh, can come into play uh, when you have a chc you have no contribution and the care act uh, that often provides for aspects of care that fall outside of, uh, of the section 117 uh, provision and that is means tested so there can be, in terms of looking at leave, uh, best interest options and care packages, there can be uh, major implications for uh, uh, funding of care packages and what public bodies are willing to uh, uh, deal with. Uh, in these situations in the Court of Protection, you do end up with fact-finding hearings and evidence from both responsible clinician and other parties on best interests. And that can be quite a lengthy pro process if it's contested. Uh, and the question is, well, what if the Court of Protection does not authorise the deprivation of liberty or does not consider the chosen placement to be in a person's best interests, despite the fact they're ready to be discharged and there's no legal basis for them to re re remain in hospital further, what do you do then? Um, I haven't come across that, but it's potentially there. You could end up with a conflict between uh, the responsible clinician and uh, the judge of the court of protection as to what is in a patient's best interest and whether that uh, uh, requires that patient to be uh, uh, deprived of their liberty. The key problem with funders is the guiding principle comes from uh, the Supreme Court case of um, N versus AGG and others. And the guiding principle is that the function of the Court of Protection is to take, to take on behalf of adults who lack capacity the decisions which, if they had capacity, they would take themselves. The Court of Protection has no more power just because it's acting on behalf of an adult who lacks capacity to obtain resources or facilities from a third party, whether private, a private individual or public authority, then the adult, if he had capacity, would be able to obtain for himself. 
So effectively, funding bodies such as CCGs have a lot of power in terms of what uh, placements and what packages uh, they will fund for persons who are discharged from hospital. And that can be both difficult in respect of uh, patients who have been conditionally discharged, uh, the, what we call the forensic patients, and also community patients. Uh, there are caveats to uh, uh, what the Supreme Court talked about, and that is, uh, you know, the Court of Protection has these various powers to uh, mediate, get consultation for people to get together. But if the uh, CCG takes, for example, a CCG takes a position, they are only going to uh, cut, uh, fund this because that meets the patient's needs, then the court of protection is really restricted in terms of really looking at the best interests of uh, the person who's then going to be deprived of their liberty. And often there's a great deal of delay in enacting care plans. So do, at some point you may have to consider uh, bringing a claim in uh, the administrative court to uh, deal with some of these issues. Uh, and just to uh, uh, look at the funding issues again, in respect of 21A proceedings, non-means tested legal aid is available for the patient and the RPR. For other pay per persons, it would depend on their eligibility for funding. In respect of personal welfare under Section 16, that is subject to means testing. And you can have the perverse scenario where a uh, respondent other than P is funded, but not P uh, when, it, when it's all to do with P's uh, liberty. Uh, funding of deputy ships is out of scope unless you could uh, secure exceptional funding. And that is often something that's forgotten about when people are being discharged from psychiatric hospital, that you do need uh, uh, to have a deputy in place. And for uh, Helen's uh, uh, state of mind, that's my uh, doorbell going off, not my fire alarm. And various things are problematic in terms of uh, litigation friends involved in the official solicitor, uh, they will only uh, operate when there are funds, you may be able to seek an indemnification from a public body, and uh, when there is no funding under legal aid, there's little option other than to uh, uh, privately fund it in some way. So that's my timer going off saying I've had 25 minutes. So just the conclusions and questions, it's a difficult and complex system to navigate. There's potential for injustice and unfairness, may not meet someone's needs or best interest in the end because of the way of uh, funding restrictions and, and the limits on the powers of the court of protection. Potential for a great deal of conflict between various statutory bodies, including the responsible clinician. Uh, should there be a reform of legislative framework and funding of complex care packages? And my answer to that is yes. Uh, there's draft legislation in Northern Ireland to create one scheme, but it's been stuck uh, because um, uh, Stormont has been stuck. Uh, there's going to be a reform of the Mental Health Act. I don't know the details of that yet. Role of the administrative court? Well, you can in some, some areas, but that would just add to the delay in the process. And it's really not uh, looking at merits, it's just looking at process. Uh, and the bully pulpit, uh, a court of protection judge, as I've seen and experienced, particularly in the high court, they do, although they're not supposed to, they, they do operate on a little bit of a bully pulpit role where they try and nudge and push people in particular ways to mediate and cooperate and improve on things. So it's getting used to that notion that uh, a judge in a cop uh, does have soft powers and, uh, uh, and really that's something to consider. So that, that, that's it from me. I've gone a bit over time. Do you need uh, to get the door to? That's the critical no, question. Uh, they can come back. Don't know who it is. Um, Tim, thanks so much. Um, you've covered an astonishing amount of ground in a relatively short period of time. Um, 
just by way of reminder for those watching the slides um, that you've seen from both Helen and Tim will be sent um, by our colleagues in the events team uh, in, in a short time after this webinar. Um, we do now have time for questions. Um, I've had a couple of questions in the chat and I don't know whether um, the people who've posted questions in the chat are happy for me to ask them or if they would uh, like me to unmute them so that they can ask the questions themselves. Um, I think the way that we can do this is if you do want to ask a question yourself, if you just raise your hand um, using the option at the, at the bottom of your presentation screen, uh, I should be able to see that and then I can unmute you, um, I hope, um, in order to enable you to talk. Um, and while I'm, I'll just have a quick scan through. Uh, first question from Tom Griffiths, please. Tom. Oh, no, hang on, let me take you off mute. I, I, I can ask it to both, sorry. I, I, I go do. ahead, Tom. Yeah. Um, it's a question to both people. It's just the role of the responsible clinician, uh, which is defined as a, a psychiatrist, as far as I can see. What if a person, for whatever reason, doesn't accept the biomedical model of psychiatry and wants some other authorised person to decide on his or her mental state and sees that person as a better arbiter of what's in his, of, yeah, a, his mental state and, uh, yeah, best interest linked to that. It's just, uh, I'm involved with movements to question biomedical psychiatry and I just want to know the limits, legal limits of that remit. Thanks, Tom. So legal limits on those who can offer um, assessments of capacity for the purposes of the issues that Helen was touching on in her presentation. Um, Helen, I suppose we will come to you first. I was going to say Tim because he just went through what the uh, responsible clinician uh, can and can't do. Yeah. But um, sorry, Tim. I mean, I think one, one thing what has to be recognised is that um, a responsible clinician is someone who is specifically authorised under section uh, 12 uh, of the Mental Health Act. So they are, some, they are somebody who primarily their role is solely in respect of the care and treatment of uh, the patient under the Mental Health Act. They formally have no role uh, other than that statutory duty. They are a psychiatrist, but they have this particular statutory power under section 12. And generally that's to make recommendations about detention or not and treatment in hospital or not. They can themselves make assessments of capacity in respect of um, tribunal proceedings. But in reality, uh, when you're talking about assessments of capacity in relation to social care, you're talking more of social workers or psychologists, people who don't, who don't actually have the role of a Section 12 responsible clinician. So, for example, if in a tribunal there was concerns about uh, the patient's capacity during giving evidence, that in reality it should not be for the uh, responsible clinician or the medical member to determine that. Uh, someone in the hospital or someone else independent of that, of them, should be doing those assessments because um, the responsible clinician is playing a particular role in uh, the proceedings and so is the medical member. So they should properly adjourn and get an independent form of assessment. So there's no requirement, as I understand it, that any capacity assessment within the tribunal be co conducted by the, the responsible clinician. And if one looks at the general um, uh, guidance on capacity assessments under the, uh, the Code of Guidance under the Mental Capacity Act, it can be various types of uh, persons uh, depending on their particular form of expertise. It doesn't have to be a psychiatrist 
Uh, I agree with that, Tim. I'd just add, though, that in the Live Well case or the Live Well case, where the medical member at the pre-hearing examination raised the issue of capacity and the RC uh, concurred that prior to the hearing, the patient lacked capacity. Um, they then went on to really consider about the, how does all of that sit in terms of getting an independent expert or an independent assessment? How does that sit with the speedy resolution of the review um, of the detention. So there is that other factor, which I think is why they say once capacity is raised as an issue, um, do something about it um, earlier rather than waiting until much closer in time to a hearing, which you know potentially jeopardizes the resolution of the review for the patient. Um, sorry if I've, uh, sorry, Michael, if I've. No, 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 it's very helpful. I actually had a, I actually am going to exercise Chair's prerogative and ask a follow-up question um, touching on some of those issues. Um, what do you think the scope is um, just in terms of using the um, tribunal's own appointment power for representatives and um, the extent to which that might provide a means of avoiding what might otherwise be a longer delay, whether that would be an appropriate shortcut, if you like, or whether the, the, the better approach is to to go through something with a with a proper independent assessment? Well, they, they can exercise the, I mean, the Rule 11 appointment of a representative is important to safeguard uh, the patient, but that doesn't necessarily introduce an, an independent assessment of capacity. Uh, um, the once appointed, the representative has to act on the patient's best interests. Um, so it, it isn't um, a capacity assessment. Obviously, if um, the representative felt having arrived that the patient was going to the tribunal thinking the patient did have capacity and then discovered that in their assessment the person did not have capacity, then that they'd be under a duty to, to raise that with the tribunal. And the tribunal does have powers um, to take steps to safeguard the patient's uh, right to review. I mean, the difficulty is within um, the operation of the Mental Health Tribunal, if you think about it, uh, the, the reason why someone is detained under the Mental Health Act and remains detained it, it is a medical view and a view of family members, for example, that their, their, their mental disorder is of, of a nature or degree that it's a risk to them or uh, a risk to other persons around them. And one, the difficulty is that within those tribunal, within those proceedings, people uh, effectively are saying, well, uh, that person being by reason of their mental illness is unable to make capacity decisions about their own uh, mental health care and treatment and then uh, so do you say that the tribunal should be deprived of hearing evidence from a person who uh, uh, lacks effectively capacity to give evidence arising out of their mental disorder so you you end up the risk of conflating uh, the test under the mental capacity act with a test under the mental health act and, uh, and and that's problematic because um, we are looking at whether whether it be safe effectively to discharge somebody, and the the, the tests of capacity are issue specific, and the question will be, uh, does this person have capacity to uh, conduct this tribunal? does this person have capacity to give credible evidence effectively to the tribunal? Uh, that, though, though, that there would be sort of very narrow issues upon which a um, tribunal would be looking at issues of capacity in respect of conduct of the tribunal. For example, the case that Helen spoke about is when somebody started to have auditory, auditory hallucinations during uh, 
their, their, their evidence giving, uh, you know, should, should, should given the ambit of the tribunal, the tribunal not be, be aware that that person suffers with that and does that impact on the discharge decision or does that impact on the ability of the person to give, um, have, a, have a fair hearing in the tribunal and how do you really judge that? Tricky stuff. Um, let's move on. Uh, Karen Walton has a question. Uh, let me just make sure that I unmute you. There you go. Right, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Karen, yeah. fire away. Hi, hello. Um, yeah, I was a bit worried when you said, Tim, that under Section 17.3, you still couldn't... Uh, well, I wasn't entirely sure what you meant. Um, because we've always worked on the assumption that Section 17.3 gives um, RCs uh, complete carte blanche to let people go off for testing and that they can be um, detained in the care home to which they, they have gone to be tested out on leave. So I could just explain that a little bit more. Well, if you look at it, it only authorises detention in other hospitals. They don't what, Sorry. It only authorises detention in the hospital. No, so if somebody goes to a residential care home for testing out, so a lot of our clients go out um, yeah. to a care home, they will uh, have increasing periods of unescorted leave, or maybe they won't have any unescorted leave, but yeah. they'll just stay in the care home for five yeah. weeks or so. We've always assumed that Section 17.3 gives the managers power to authorise the care home to detain the patient. Well, the thing is, is that Section 17 doesn't. Uh, what you have to have is a, a separate authorisation to do that. But Section 17.3 says that, that uh, the person can be kept in the custody of any person authorised by the managers. Of a hospital. Of the hospital, yeah. And in a hospital. Well, I don't think that's what it says. And in fact, Jones says um, that the, uh, the RC can give power to the managers of the care home in writing um, yeah. to keep somebody in custody. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think that's right. I think that in practice, Karen, um, Section 17 does happen, Section 17.3 does happen, and that's the means by which someone who's medically fit for discharge and the RC is considering where that discharge could be. Um, they will grant uh, Section 17.3 leave so that P in the Court of Protection, referred to as the protect P as the protected party, um, P can go home with a package of care um, for X number of weeks um, whilst it's tried out. And if it breaks down, then they've retained their place at the hospital. Um, and I think it is used in practice. And in fact, in the MC um, case, uh, MC was precisely that on Section 17.3 long-term leave. I think that the, um, the guidance uh, also refers to the availability of that and the Birmingham Council um, City Council decision by Mrs Justice Leaven says that it's sort of an open question um, because sometimes the Secretary of State wants to retain control under the Mental Health Act rather than allow the Court of Protection uh, to use its um, powers under the deprivation of liberty um, to restrict uh, somebody or to detain somebody effectively who um, can't consent to their deprivation of liberty. So I think in practice, the Section 17.3 is being used by RCs um, and I think that going forward, it looks as though the maybe the supervised, supervised discharge route that the white paper for the Mental Health Act reform um, is talking about supervised discharge to ensure that there aren't any difficulties uh, about this. Um, there is still obviously room for conflict. I'm just uh, something just beeped, sorry. Um, so I, I think that uh, about uh, Dr. Baldwin's um, legal prowess on this, but I think that in practice, certainly in the Court of Protection, it's being seen um, as a route by which placements are tested out. 
Yeah, because it's not just people um, who would be eligible for doles that this applies to, is it? A lot of people who wouldn't be eligible for doles go exactly. out. On because the, because they've got capacity. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I mean, if, if it wasn't possible to send somebody on leave, and detain them in a care home under the auspices of Section 73, it would make things impossibly difficult, I think, um, because well, um, that's the very nature of testing out. Just what it says, I mean, there's a commentary in Jerome's on uh, paragraph 1232, uh, two, and, and it's from uh, Leave of Absence and Deprivation of Liberty, the Supreme, where he says, Welsh ministers and PJ, the Supreme Court held there's no implied power to impose conditions in a community treatment order which have the effect of de depriving patient of a liberty. It is submitted that logical implication of this decision is that apart from express powers contained in subsection 3, and that's section 17, no, no power exists under the section. And if a close reading of that section, as I, I understand it, says where it appears to the responsible clinician that it is necessary to do so in the interest of the patients or for the protection of other persons, he may, upon granting uh, uh, leave of absence under the section, direct, direct that the patient remain in custody during his absence and where the leave of absence is so granted, the patient may be kept in custody of officer or on the staff of the hospital or any other person authorised in writing by managers of the hospital, or if the patient is required uh, in condition uh, required re required in accordance with the conditions imposed in a grant of leave of absence to reside in another hospital, or any other any officer of the staff of that other hospital. Yeah, so, but so, yeah. so so that there could be a conflict uh, mm -hmm. as to whether, uh, in respect of uh, authorizing a deprivation of liberty under Section Seventeen Three in a care placement when you have a mechanism uh, in respect of somebody who lacks capacity mm. um, it, it is something that the responsible clinician can do given that you have the particular uh, provisions in respect of uh, the court of protection when you can't do it with a community treatment order. Yeah. Um, I hope you don't mind um, if I um, thanks very much. I mean, it's a really interesting discussion. I'm just conscious that we have yeah. quite a few other questions in the chat and and uh, limited time available. Um, Karen, I'm sure um, if you wanted to drop the team an email uh, or to pick up this conversation in some other forum, I'm sure we'd be um, really happy to do that. Um, and I hope you don't feel that you're being unduly cut off. Um, but thank you for raising a really interesting question. Um, I'm going to move on to another question now, and this one's from Elizabeth Cleaver. Um, Elizabeth, you haven't raised your hand in the chat, so I'm assuming you're all right for me to just read the question out for you. Um, do raise your hand if you want to come in on the discussion and response. And the question is this, um, a section 3741 patient will be subject to conditions upon discharge from hospital set by the Ministry of Justice or the Mental Health Tribunal, usually including a condition about where they should live. Would it be correct to say that the Court of Protection does not have a role in resolving a dispute about discharge destination for a section 3741 patient, since the decision of the MOJ slash MHT would take precedence. I'm thinking of a situation where P lacks capacity to decide where they should live upon discharge, but there is a dispute as to whether they require a care home placement versus a return to their own home upon conditional discharge from hospital. Well, I mean, the, the conditions of the conditional discharge would dominate. I think so. Um, I think it's the, the Mental Health is, Act and yeah, the Secretary the of State. Is, uh, the question would be is um, what, uh, what, the, what the care package provides for in terms of deprivation of liberty. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, if, if someone lacks capacity to make decisions about where to live and receive care, the question would be is, well, um, the MOJ and the responsible clinician determine where that person's going to live. The question would then be, if that person lacked capacity, would there still be a requirement or an indication under the care plan that they would be deprived of their liberty and whether uh, the court of protection would review that as to being in that person's best interest because the, 
terms of the care plan in respect of further deprivation of liberty lies outside of the conditional discharge criteria. So I, I think that the core protection don't have the power to resolve that. No. If that answers the question, I hope, Elizabeth. I mean, if there was an alternative option of going home, um, the MOJ would say no, and that would be it. It would be, you know, that would be part of the pathway plan, perhaps, but uh, the court of protection could really say no about that. Elizabeth, did you want to come in? Uh, thank you very much. I think that's very helpful. And that's that's really what I um, I suspected, really, but it's a scenario that's occurred in, in, in a case of mine recently. And my, my gut feeling was that um, the court probably couldn't make a decision about where he should live upon discharge. It's going to be effectively imposed upon them, really, as a result of the, the MOJ conditions or the MHT decision upon uh, their conditional discharge. Uh, I suppose the question then becomes if, because this, this particular piece certainly lacks capacity to make decisions about where she should live and may well be subject to a standard authorization in a care home um, upon her conditional discharge, uh, whether um, further down the line, there can be a section 21A challenge brought by her in relation to that care home placement um, and whether the court at that point would have um, would be able to make decisions about um, whether it's in her best interest or whether the, the conditions of standard authorisation are met for her continued placement within that care home or, or whether, again, uh, because there would then be a conflict with the conditions of her conditional discharge set by the Ministry of Justice or the tribunal, whether, uh, again, that wouldn't be the correct forum and she ought to be looking at applying for an absolute discharge at the tribunal. Um, do you have any views on that? I mean, I think the only the thing is that you shouldn't have a care plan uh, that conflicts with the conditional discharge criteria. That's a fundamental thing. If, yeah. if she is subject to uh, a deprivation of liberty of standard authorisation, then as long as you can identify what what the criteria of challenge is, that is, you know, effectively is the dole, it, it, are the conditions of the dole or the dole justified in, in, in some senses. Uh, she could challenge that. But the reality is, is that it's a limited form of challenge in respect of review of the standard authorization effectively, uh, separately from the conditional discharge. And if there are any conflicts uh, between uh, the, stand, the terms of the standard authorization and the conditional discharge, then the, the standard authorization has to be amended to fit within uh, the parameters of the conditional discharge. Mm, uh, agree. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Elizabeth. Um, in the five minutes that we have left, I'm ambitiously going to try and squeeze in two more questions from the Q and A, um, both for uh, Helen. Um, the first is, um, uh, for, these are both from uh, anonymous attendees, um, but the first is that uh, Helen mentioned that the Mental Health Act Administrator might be able to assist a patient without capacity to make an application to the tribunal, should such an application be made via a reference um, or made on behalf of the patient or either. Or both. <laughs> um, initially, certainly, the IMHA can assist making the the actual tribunal the actual tribunal application in terms of forms and things like that. But definitely, if there's a question over capacity, then the swiftest way to do it, I think, would be to prompt a reference so that there will be a proper Rule Eleven appointment and that the patient's interests will be safeguarded. Great. Uh, and, and the second question, uh, in fact, is from Luke Coleman, uh, and it says, with uh, the Live Well case in mind, um, this was a physical Rule 34 examination. Um, the propensity for a Rule 34 assessment to take place during COVID is very limited. Um, how does Judge Johnson's dissenting judgment sit currently? Do you think that given that the, F, the first time the FTT will see the patient is on the day of the hearing and so not have the opportunity to see the patient mm -hmm. um, uh, effectively um, relying only on effect, the written reports that they've read in advance uh, and how, how you think the issue, what issues that might give rise to and how they might be resolved? 
Th thanks very much for the question and to, to the previous uh, question. Um, it's it's. I, I like that dissenting judgment. I have to say, <laughs> I enjoyed reading it very much, and it gives it really emphasises the need for P. In that case, um, she was sitting outside the tribunal hearing, and uh, they dismissed her application for want of jurisdiction on the basis she didn't have capacity to make the application at the time when they constructed uh, the capacity as it was in the past two weeks earlier. Um, I think that obviously as we move out of these restrictive times, I hear, I don't know if it's true or not, but I hear that there is some appetite for going back towards in-person hearings, but I don't think that for the first tier tribunal that's going to be this year big intake of breath. Um, so that means that the pre-hearing examinations, um, I mean, they, they look as though the remote uh, assessments that are being carried out are being carried out a little bit more easily, but they're obviously suboptimal. Um, so the idea that somebody is being assessed over a screen, particularly in with certain um, patients with particular uh, mental disorders, it's just wholly inappropriate and um, counterproductive. Uh, how does the dissenting judgment sit? I mean, it was pre-COVID, pre how does anything sit um, with the way things are now? I think that my sense is that the duty is going to fall increasingly heavily on hospital managers um, of the responsible authority who can't be unaware if, uh, or the nursing staff or the named nurse to bring this issue of capacity to the attention um, of the Mental Health Act administrator at least, um, or make sure that it's noted somewhere so that if there is an application that's to be made, um, that the steps that can be taken ensure that the hearing can be effective because it's not going to fall foul of the Live Well decision. Uh, sorry, that's a bit of a rambly way of answering your question, I, Luke. That's a good question of Helen, uh, which I didn't understand about the decision of, uh, saying there's a want of jurisdiction. Um, one, I've never understood there to be a requirement that a psychiatric patient has to have uh, legal capacity to make the application. And secondly, in circumstances where you get uh, the referral from, say, the Secretary of State, where you, um, where someone's not made a, an application for a while, uh, uh, the, the MRJ can make a, a, a referral. How did that really sit with that decision? Because you have another party making an application on behalf of somebody who's not made an application. So, well, the statute obviously provides for the reference every three years and in other circumstances under the Act. So that reference, um, you know, sometimes those hearings that result as a, as a, that come about as a result of the reference are extremely short and, and the patient isn't there and there's and nothing happens. Um, but it said, uh, if I can remember in the Livewell decision, um, Miss Justice Nicholl, I think it was, um, or Miss Justice Ward, they were the, the majority decision makers who said that um, you've got to have uh, capacity to make an application, even though it was strongly argued from memory that uh, there was nowhere that said you had to. And obviously the bar is low and things like that, but they said the fact that it's silent isn't, uh, doesn't mean that you don't have to have uh, capacity. They seem to be, I mean, maybe I've, maybe you can, um, maybe we'll have to edit this, Tim, and you can tell me that I've got it wrong yeah. before it's sent out on a recording. But, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I couldn't figure out that bit of the judgment. So if it seems to ab abrogate people's rights when naturally, for example, when, you're, when they're detained early, say under section two, um, when it's vital that they absolutely patients, but um, it's it seems almost as of right, not as of 
capacity. Complete, completely, I agree. I agree. Um, I'm just conscious of time. We are a couple of minutes over, but I've just okay. noticed that Luke has um, got his hand up. And since we are answering his question, perhaps we should um, give Luke oh. an opportunity to come in. Luke? And to, to be honest, I think, thanks. I think Helen answered the majority of what I was going to ask in addition. I think you. it was more... Thanks, it, Luke. No, that's <laughs> right. it, it was more that I had a colleague who was sort of slightly lambasted by the tribunal over this issue of capacity when the application was made. And I think you answered this, but obviously there's a clear distinction between the circumstances of live well, uh, live well and the circumstances currently, given that we're in COVID. And, Definitely. You know, I mean, I, what I was trying, I was curious about, and I think you've answered it, is that if a patient makes a Section 3 application, you know, considerably uh, long ago, um, because, you know, tribunals in that sort of form take about six to eight sure. weeks, very difficult to answer the question of capacity at the time you made the application when often written reports can be quite sparse with information. Yeah. I mean, do, do you think, you know, if tribunals routinely at the moment in these covid times tried making decisions to strike it out if they thought capacity was an issue you could be sort of entering into ultra virus territory but very possibly i mean i did the the decision does say that it's forensically really difficult to reconstruct capacity and you know that must be right because capacity as we know it's time specific so it just reads really sort of weirdly that we're superimposing a lack of capacity on an applicant who's seeking discharge at a time when the application was signed some weeks prior. But obviously the point becomes far more um, potent given, as you say, Luke, the delay between making an application and then capacity becoming potentially an issue later on. Um, so I, I, I would imagine that uh, my sense, for what it's worth, from first-tier tribunals is that they're not looking to strike out applications. They would rather not. <laughs> and yeah. so um, if there can be a way of a person who is known or potentially lacks capacity for that reference to be made so that there can be a Rule 11 appointment, I think that's just the safer way. Uh, and one of the things as well, Luke, that I've never understood as well, if you... If if it's right that uh, you say that the person has that capacity to make the application, it's not only time specific, but it's issue specific and how that is identified. And secondly, if, if they can't make it, who makes it on their behalf? Because there's no provision for litigation friends. Mm. Yeah, that was one of my other questions, Tim, but I think you answered it. You preempted what I was going to say, which obviously there's a clear distinction between court of protection proceedings and RPRs and what we have in a mental health forum, which is nobody who really can make the application other than the patient or the secretary of state if a referral was made. Um, so, yeah, no, you've answered my question. Thank you. But I think the IMHA, that's why the IMHA was sort of, they actually considered adjourning in the Livewell case, adjourning SM's application to allow the IMHA to attend. But because she was so heavily pregnant, they didn't know how long, if they did adjourn to allow the IMHA to attend and help her, um, where she would be in the coming weeks because of the pregnancy. So, I mean, as all of these situations are very fact specific, um, but uh, there's something to certainly bear in mind but yes the the the, the mental health act, health act reform the white paper potentially might be talking about equating um the role of an imha in the mental health tribunal with the kind of rpr in the court of protection so allowing a sort of formal role of initiating the application in the first place but anyway that's we'll see what the future brings on that one thanks very much Th thanks luke for the question um another really great contribution um, I think we have reached the point in the evening where I have to bring proceedings to a close. But before I do, let me do two things. First of all, just pick up a question that was asked in the chat about whether the webinar qualifies for CPD points. Um, I'm told, um, with thanks to my colleagues in the events team, uh, that it does. Uh, and secondly, to thank uh, Helen and Tim, um, not only for their fantastic presentations, but also their responses to the equally fantastic questions from um, those of you who have stuck with the webinar all the way through, even though we are technically seven minutes over, hopefully that won't be the beginning of the end of my career as a <laughs> event chairman in Chambers.
There isn't um, a match on, Michael. You're all right. There isn't a match on. <laughs> there is. There is at eight o'clock. Though, yeah. Though. Well, you know what I mean. Just after, got some time. After last week when there was a horrible <laughs> clash. Right, nice to know that my future is safe, at least for now. Um, thank you very much to everyone for attending. We hope that you found the event useful. Um, as I indicated before, um, the copy of the slides that you see will be sent round um, in the next day or so. Um, the recording of this event is likely to appear on our social media pages and you can go to our website to find out details of both past and future events. Uh, and the next event, I understand, is on the 12th of July, um, which actually relates to immigration appeals and remedies uh, and the second part of a new handbook launch um, for that. So if that's your particular bag slash cup of tea, um, do join us for that on the 12th of July. Thanks very much and have a good evening. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Tim.